Welcome back to another great episode of the Cross Border Interviews with Christopher Brown. Uh, we are pleased and honored to have our guest in today. He is a returning guest back in November uh, 10th. We had him on the show. And uh, for those who are listening to this, because we are in sort of a YouTube jail right now, because we we had a strike against us on YouTube, this will be coming out later on. But for those who are listening to this, we are pleased and honored to welcome the leader of the Alberta party, Barry Morishita, on the show. Barry, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it once again. Oh, thanks, Chris. Uh, it's always a pleasure to talk to you. Um, as I said in our pre-interview, uh, a day in politics is a long time. A week in politics seems like forever. And this last week here in Alberta, here in Canada, and particularly around the world, we have seen news after news after news break. But I want to start locally here in Alberta with the provincial budget that was tabled uh, late last week. Uh, Jason Kenney government projects that there will be a $511 million surplus due to the rising oil prices. Uh, I just want to get your first initial reaction to the budget that was tabled last week. Well, you know, it, it's, it's always a wonderful thing to not have a deficit budget. Um, that's, you know, you're not accumulating any debt and uh, you're not paying for that. So that's good. But I mean, it's not good planning that got us here. It's actually fortuitous world prices that you know Alberta unfortunately doesn't have any control of and so when you take away the windfall oil uh, revenue the resource revenue you know we're in a deficit so it doesn't uh, you know to, to stand there and say you know this is how we planned it out and, and it was our good planning that got us here is it's it's deceptive at best um, and certainly doesn't bode well for the future of Alberta when it comes to being able to uh, to lead when it comes to finances. So I'm, I'm a bit discouraged by it. Now, I, I should also mention that uh, this $511 million surplus is a projected surplus. This is on the assumption that the oil prices stay the way they are and everything else goes the way that it does. Um, I, I want to talk about the uh, path forward shadow budget that the Alberta party released earlier than the uh, budget that was uh, released by Jason Kenney. And in that you talk about getting off of the sort of the boom and bust cycle of the oil industry. How do we do that when uh, Alberta has been traditionally reliant on the oil industry as a resource, as a financial sort of backing for its budgets? Uh, you know, Chris, I, you, you, you spelled out the problem really, really well. The fact is, is that Alberta, certainly since the mid 80s, maybe even the early 80s, has come to rely on, on resource revenue to balance our books, to pay for the services that were, are being delivered uh, to us on our behalf through the government. So, you know, I think, you know, his, historically, we've treated it poorly, to be honest. Um, the, the fact is, is that just let me just share a couple of numbers with you today. So in the budget that was released earlier, there's nearly 3 billion, I think it's around $2.6 billion being spent on servicing the debt. And the debt has been accumulated because we've had governments in the past, and certainly in the past 10 years, who have failed to realize that they're, they're not collecting enough for the services that, that we require. And no one has ever had the courage uh, or honest or, or, and you know, it's not just courage, it's trusting Albertans to understand that we have a problem and that it's systemic. And if we don't get away from it, we're going to find ourselves in a giant hole, uh, more giant than it is. We're in a hundred billion dollar hole now. We're paying nearly $3 billion a year to service that debt at the current rate of interest, which we've done nothing to address inflation, of course. That's only going to cost us more. And it's only by the grace of good luck that we're here. So our shadow budget, in fact, tackles that head on. So resources are something that belong to the people of Alberta. They belong to us currently. We should get benefit from it currently. And our future generations should as well. And one of the, one of the cornerstones of our shadow budget is to say 50% of what's collected right now should be going to debt reduction to reduce our current costs. And the other 50% should be saved to turn the Heritage Trust Fund into the fiscal powerhouse it was meant to be when it was established by Peter Lougheed. Subsequent governments have failed to do that. And as a result, um, 
we're not as we're not in a steady we're not in a good place when it comes to fluctuations uh, and it's not just fluctuations in oil price you know that all governments have been affected by the economy and the ups and downs of that and alberta's had a, a, in its grasp because of our our blessing of natural resources to be able to ride that out a lot better than anybody else and we've given that away so the alberta party would change that the other now, thing we have to look yeah, oh, go ahead, Chris. No, continue on, and then I'll then I'll ask this follow up question to that because it is an important one. But I want to let you continue on with your statement first. Sure. The other thing is is that you know we we have a we have a cost for the services that are provided. So even if we take debt servicing aside for a minute, we are still in a deficit for what services we provide as a government to the people of Alberta. And you know we believe that in order to be uh, responsible stewards, um, if the electorate, you know, needs services to a certain level, then we have to present the op uh, the option, or not the option, but the real hard case that this is how much it costs. Now, are there efficiencies to be gained? Absolutely. I still believe the budgeting process itself isn't the greatest one we have, and I think there's lots of improvement. But it still won't get us to zero. The fact remains is that we've consistently underfunded services relative to what we pay in taxes, uh, for 30 or more years, and we have to fix it. And so the Alberta party would look at other tools to modernize the system, to make sure that we're, we have equity there so that what you're collecting in taxes is what you're paying in services. And we'd have to come to reconciliation. So we would look at different tools, um, changing the tax structure, including, uh, putting in a consumption tax of some kind because consumption tax is much easy, easier to collect. It's cheaper to collect. And on top of that, it's easier to allow for higher exemption levels. So lower income people can, can benefit from that types of tax structure um, and get direct benefit from it. It's not weighted benefit or benefit that comes later. It's immediate benefit and they'll be allowed to actually advance and we'll have a fairness. There's 90,000 people sometimes in Alberta that pay no tax whatsoever. They pay no income tax. We don't have a sales tax, they pay nothing. They use our services in the province for free and the rest of us carry it. And to illustrate it really, really more specifically, Chris, as you can see, I get pretty <laughs> riled up about this, but uh, the, 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 the town site of Jasper, which is in the national park, has a capped population of 4,500 people. They can't have more than that, that's the max. But yet they have to supply wastewater treatment services and protective services, police and other things for up to 40,000 people on the backs of that same municipality. Now, if we were collecting a sales tax on all the activity that visitors generated, there would be an opportunity for us to more equitably treat a community like Jasper. Uh, but as it is now, we don't have that inner toolbox. And, um, you know, we have to have that conversation with Albertans. We have to be able to trust them that with good information will come good decisions. And that's the road I think we have to look down. Now, you weren't advocating for a provincial sales tax and the path forward shadow budget that was released. And if anyone wants to look at it, it's in the show notes. Please check it out. You're, you're advocating for a harmonized sales tax. Now, for those who are listening, and I, I know a harmonized sales tax because I'm from Ontario and we had one when we were there. Basically, what it does is takes the provincial sales tax and the GST and puts them together and the, gov the federal government collects it and it gives it back to the provinces. Why do you believe that is the best path, path forward? Uh, because it is actually a cheaper system. It's easier, it's less complicated for businesses. One submission, you only have to do that once. There's one point of collection, makes it a lot easier for uh, at point of sale. So for all businesses, it's simpler. For the provincial government, it's, it's, it's a bonus because the cost of setting up your own collection system would, you know, it's not prohibitive, but at the same time, why, why take on an unnecessary cost when the federal government is willing to do that for you? Um, contrary to popular belief, we don't have to ask for it back. That's part of the deal. You collect it, it comes to you, comes directly to you without, you know, fees or them scraping off a little off the top. It is what you collect and you get it. So it just makes a lot of sense, Chris. Now, you mentioned it earlier, but I want to I wanna sort of make sure that people who are listening to this know 
we have a party in power right now who says that we do not need more taxes, especially during a time of economic uncertainty with a lot of people. You're advocating for a harmonized sales tax. Is that not just burdening people who are struggling right now with more potentially income out of their pockets? So no, I, I you know, so there's, so there's two different, so there's two things we have to remember that if we bring in a harmonized sales tax, it's going to balance off. We want to modernize the whole system. So there are trade-offs in that system. We would be looking at kind of removing things that are, are less flexible, that are regressive for people who are on fixed incomes and lower incomes. So uh, potentially looking at, um, and, and we haven't fleshed out all of the details because one of the things the party does is, is we want to get in with experts. And there's a number of very well-written papers by some very good people. In fact, people the current government even rely on. Jack Mintz is an advocate of, 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 the, uh, of looking at some sort of a consumption tax or activity tax. So um, we have to look at modernizing the system so there is net benefit. And the net benefit in my mind is that because the harmonized system versus other forms of taxation is a lot easier to allow people on fixed or lower incomes to be able to adjust their income so that they're not penalized by that. So higher exemption levels so that you wouldn't pay, you know, um, any, any income tax on a much higher level than you are at now. There wouldn't be, um, there would potentially be tax credits, like actual credits back to low income uh, in order to compensate them for some of those things. So I think the system becomes flexible uh, and it becomes a lot more responsive to what the actual needs are. And so, yes, do we have to, do we still have to reconcile that? And yes, we would be collecting more tax overall uh, in order to pay for that. But we would also be on the other side of the ledger, servicing less debt, reducing our debt and saving. So this isn't just a one year hit or a two year hit. This is a financial plan that's gonna serve Alberta really well in the future. And if we don't start thinking like that, we are going to leave this province in a very, very rough shape um, for our future generations. And, and we just have to stop thinking like that. Now, you, earlier on in your uh, statement, you, you used a word that a lot of people are struggling with right now, and that is inflation. The cost of services, the cost of goods are going up. This budget does little, if anything, to address that. We are still seeing skyrocketing energy prices. We are seeing utility bills in the seven to eight hundred dollar for a single income house. How do we address inflation? While it is a federal issue as well, the provinces can do things to address inflation to help people sort of get through these troubling times. What does the Alberta Party plan or want to see happen to help? struggling Albertans today? So I think it's kind of setting that foundation, Chris. We should, should have been in a position to be able to deal with this really quickly. But our, I, you know, you know, our current financial situation, I don't know all the details of it. It's hard to root out all of that out of what's been presented to this point. Um, but, but, you know, imagine we're in a better financial position. We have savings. Uh, you know, we have less debt. So we can actually be advantaged today by our resource wealth. Imagine that we weren't putting a cap or putting a cap at 650, which doesn't affect anybody right now. It's just, you know, an empty promise made in the budget to make think people like we're listening. This doesn't affect you or I. Um, my gas price is 450 or 550 or whatever it is. And I, like you said, our costs are our costs. But if we could mitigate that because of financial strength, we could do that immediately because we should be recipients of the energy boom that we're getting. But right now, because of our current fiscal situation, this government has chosen not to. Um, I think there's capacity in there so that you are balancing that. And like I said before, resource revenue should be a benefit for people who are currently in Alberta and for people who are going to be here in the future. And if we manage our finances, we could give immediate relief because of those boom numbers right now if we were in a better financial position right we could do that right now now a lot as someone who has municipal background as the former mayor of brooks alberta you you know that municipalities have to balance their budget each year um and that is that sometimes means that services have to be cut services have to be reduced or taxes have to go up 
How do you plan on working with municipalities? Because we are seeing more and more being offloaded to municipalities and trying to recoup the cost. And I, I think of the RCMP being the main one. They, the RCMP are due for a major increase and that's going to come on the backs of municipalities. So how do you envision working with your municipal partners if elected as premier to ensure that the property taxes that they have to set do not see a massive increase where we are potentially seeing 10% increases across this province. So that's a, you know, there's a lot to that, Chris. <laughs> I think, first of all, you have to reestablish the relationship. So right now it's, it's parochial, parental, whatever words you want to use. It's, you know, I tell you what to do when it's good. I, 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 I thank you when you're helping me. I, I, I chastise you and belittle you when it's not. I, take away authority when it when it's convenient for me I download on you when it's convenient for me uh, you know it's it's getting tiring um, and uh, having like you said been in that former role it's very very difficult to do the work you need to do when you don't know what's going on and no one's talking to you you know we've had two governments that really haven't had uh, you know they always stand at the podium and talk about partnerships and they talk about, uh, opportunities and how we're going to work together. But you know what? I was in the role as provincial president for four years through both two of those governments. And I can tell you they didn't, didn't really consult with us on anything. And they certainly didn't take any of our advice. So, so, so to that, I say we have to start over and, and have a real partnership that is entrenched, that makes sense, that allows us to have a better starting point. And then when it comes to the funding, again, once you're working at that, you can start to work actually with, you know, what should I be doing? What should you be doing? How should we share that? You know, we don't all have to have our fingers in every pie. Um, you know, I'll take housing, for example. You know, what could happen in housing is that I don't think there's any doubt that a municipality knows those needs better than the provincial government does. Uh, knows those needs better than the federal government. So why don't you, why don't we trust our elected officials? They're elected to, to say you know our job is funding housing. Your job is to build it. We share some costs, but let's get out of each other's face um, and redefine how we do that. So we can be predictable. Uh, don't have to um, plan contingency for these other things, and we can be steadier. So you know there's a lot to repairing it. There's a lot that needs to be done to fix it. Um, but I think it can be done, but you have to start base and start to respect elected officials at the municipal level uh, would be the first thing we would do to, to reestablish that. Now, I, w I wasn't going to talk about housing, but you brought it up. So let's talk about housing because this budget did not address the affordable housing. And there's a lot of people who are not able to get that first time home buyer. There's a lot of people in who, my age or younger who are able to afford their first house. How can the province and how do you see, or if you do have a policy, does the Alberta party have a policy around affordable housing for people to get into the housing market, which they desperately want to do? So we haven't developed policy, but again, it points to kind of working with the, the, the stakeholders and the, you know, Chris, I can't tell you how much money we would put towards it or those kinds of things, but I can tell you that, as I said before, we have to define our roles in each of these areas and then, and then allow, those, allow those rules to move forward, allow that activity to go forward. So the municipality wouldn't be waiting for the province. You know, we would know what we're doing, whether, whether, whether it's a municipal responsibility to do it or whether it's a provincial responsibility to do it. You can't just abdicate it and not do it which is this government's role in housing. They've just said, well, we're not going to do it. We're not going to provide any. Like you said, nothing's in the budget to advance it. Um, so nothing happens. So everybody stands around kind of looking at each other. Well, whose role is it? What am I supposed to do? Uh, municipal governments know, particularly when they have issues in affordable housing, they look around, know they've got to address it. Then they look at their fiscal situation and go, well, I can't. And then you look at your partners uh, who aren't paying attention to it at all. So that's why we are in such a terrible mess in regards to that particular file, because the province has abdicated its responsibility. And I'm not saying it's, it's to do everything. I don't know exactly what it is, but we have to work with municipalities to determine the best outcomes. Um, 
And I want to say too that you know I'm I'm under no illusion that we can't just you know change the policy tomorrow and then all of a sudden everything's rosy. The repair to some of these systems, like the reconstruction of some of these systems, is going to take some time. But I think the Alberta Party is saying you know is is going to present the real case. Is going to let you know and see what the opportunities are and and be truthful about the outcomes and. That's going to be something refreshing in Alberta politics because we're certainly not hearing it from either either group right now. We pride ourselves on going beyond that 15 second soundbite by becoming a backer of the show. With a quick visit to patreon.com and searching cross border interviews, you can help continue this show. For as little as $3 a month, your support can ensure we grow and bring new and exciting things to our growing listenership. Click the link in the show notes and back the show today. I want to take a moment and talk about COVID-19 and COVID-19 restrictions and mandates. Uh, On March 1st, this is airing on March 3rd, but on March 1st, the province entered stage two of its reopening plan. Uh, Masks are now no longer required in all public settings. I want to get your take on the, uh, I I don't want to say rush, but the changes that this government has introduced around COVID-19 and restrictions, mandates, and policies around COVID-19. Do you believe that this was the appropriate step because of the declining hospitalizations or if there was declining hospitalizations? So I I think, Chris, you know, your last part of your statement is kind of the crux of the whole matter. Was there, is there, what's the data actually telling us? What's the science telling us? And uh, it's been disappointing to kind of only hear part of the story that we get told in order for us to be supportive of a direction. And that, again, I, you know, I, I wish, I wish we had, um, could have faith that we're getting all the information in a form we can understand and then make decisions about whether we support it or not. I mean, let's face facts. Uh, all of us have been in COVID too long. We wish it was gone and wish life was different. But at the same time, we have a duty to understand what's actually going on and act appropriately. So what, so what the irony and or maybe what the hypocrisy is, is that it's at some point, I assume the data we're looking at was good enough to put in public health orders. Um, and, and to be clear, I don't think we were ever in a total lockdown. So people that use that language, I think, are, are a little bit out, out to lunch on that one. We've never been in a total lockdown. So, so but, but there was data that supported putting public health measures in. First mistake, we didn't really understand what the data was saying and why they were doing it. But, you know, at the very beginning, we kind of went and said, okay, we're trust. But we never been never had the support of the information. And so even from my perspective, you know, I can go online and I can pull some very prominent people's statistics down and their opinions about in, you know, kind of getting the data, but I really don't know the data the Alberta government made the decision on. So can I can I really comment on on that? I know that there's we we we've got a, a try we should have been doing um a, of strategy that allowed us to move forward with or without COVID as time went on, but again, supported by science. But when you're not sharing the science, it's pretty difficult. So, uh, you know, while I can't tell you whether I would have um, in the position removed restrictions on March 1st or March 7th or March 21st, I can tell you that everybody would know that the information we were making that decision on, and I would hopefully think that we would be consistent about applying it. While you can't talk about that, what you can talk about is the uh, recent uh, news that Jason Kenney was introducing changes to the uh, MGA, the Municipal Government Act, to stop cities like Edmonton and Calgary from introducing their own mask bylaws. Now, for those who don't remember, and this might be a long time ago for some, but Earlier on last summer, Jason Kenney announced that he was allowing cities to introduce their own mask mandates because it was there, it was up to them. Now he's doing an about face and changing the rules and saying, no, we're going to have one rule for the entire province. Does that make it harder to deal with a province and deal with a premier who 
says one thing one month and one thing the next month? Well, you know, <laughs> it, it's kind of the populist, the populist approach to politics, which is it's not very good planning and it's, it's terrible governance. So you're right. Um, I was mayor when those options were left out to us. In fact, Brooks in, 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 uh, in, at the peak of ours before vaccines, we had a terrible struggle with COVID. We've talked about that on your show before. And we did things well beyond what the province was doing. We were mass testing. We were providing isolation spaces. We were uh, providing supports. Um, we were doing things the, got, the province wasn't doing. Were we supposed to sit and wait and watch our community suffer while, the, while, while we have to decide, determine whether the province thinks that's good or not? I, I think, again, there you go, that the, the parochial parental uh, relationships in play. Um, it was good enough back then when they didn't want to wear uh, what, was, what needed to be done in order to control the affection back then when we were we had a lot less tools at our disposal. And now because his political statement is that we have to be, you know, carry on, move on, and we can't let Edmonton tell us what to do. I'm not gonna stand there. And you know, that, that attitude again, poorly, poorly uh, construed, no consultation. I know for a fact the mayors of, no mayors were, were contacted about this, none. Certainly not the mayors of Edmonton, Calgary, as you've seen in their press, on it. I, I know the president of a Alberta municipalities was not contacted about, hey, by the way, we're gonna take away some of your authority. What do you think of that? That wasn't done. You know, they got a heads up maybe. Um, so this type of attitude, again, for political expediency, they make a decision. They make a pronouncement, they change a policy. Is this how we're going to uh, treat municipalities? It's, it's, it's an absolute um, slap in the face. If the federal government ever said unilaterally from Ottawa, I am going to take away Alberta's authority to do A. Can you imagine what would be happening right now? <laughs> Isn't that called the Emergencies Act and the introduction of the Emergencies Act? And now Jason Kenney's taking Trudeau to jail or to court? Yeah, even though it's back to, backed away. Now, I can guarantee to the Premier, I'll say that today to him, that if you back away from changing the MGA, I don't think a single municipality will sue you. Sure. Because, you know, it's, it's ridiculous. Again, the politics, playing with important decisions on the basis of politics. You know, Albertans see through this. They see why, and, and, and so it's time to reconsider how we, how we move forward. We need thoughtful, practical, respectful governments, governance to come back to Alberta. And, and that's what I'm offering. That's what we. That's what I've done my whole life, Chris. That's what my career has been made of, and and the foundations of of my uh, career. And that's what we need to come back to. You, you talk about being on the outside and looking in and not getting the data from uh, the government, whether it be science. And I think I I, I say that as an everyone is not getting the data from the government. Right. You you talk about being open and transparent with if elected. Um, that's all great, but we've heard that story time and time again. And I, I hate to jump back on this, but I, I got to make sure that people know that we've heard it from the NDP. We've heard it from the Liberals. We've heard it from the Conservatives. And you're saying this now. How can we trust you? How can we trust you to what you're saying now is going to be what you say if elected? So, Chris, I've never done it any other way. <laughs> yep. So, so you know, I, I, I don't know if you look back on on the governance record of the NDP or, uh, well, I can tell you that when, certainly when it comes to the matters that I was involved with, I didn't know what was going on then either. Uh, certainly you can see it happening with the UCP. Uh, you can see it happening in, in, in current party politics across North America right now. Decisions that are made in, in the dark, uh, behind closed doors, and then imposed on a population and, and tell you it's best for you. You know, as a municipal politician, we're not allowed to do that. Yes, we do have conversations when the public's not involved, and, and there's very specific reasons for that. But when it comes to the debate in open public, when you're called to vote, uh, when you disclose, those, those are done in public, fully transparent. In fact, most, if not all, municipalities have governed with the point where, Chris, if you want to come and talk to us and make a submission or ask us questions, you're allowed to do that as a member of the public. 
and you can't be stopped by it from doing that. But now, so I've never done it any other way. So, um, you know, if you look back on my, my history, uh, those decisions are made in public. They're disclosed in public. We bring people in to talk about what, you know, when budget comes around, if I build this or buy that, what does that do to taxation? That conversation's happening. Do a lot of people show up uh, municipally? Sometimes we do when it's a real contentious issue. Uh, lots of times they don't, but the decisions are made in public. Your vote is counted in public. Um, we disclose all of that information at the end of the year in an audited financial statement. Um, you know, we just, it's, it's what we've always done and it's what I've always done. And uh, I, I don't know why uh, it can't be done at the provincial level. Uh, I, it gets messier, trust me, it'll be messier and people, there'll be lots, there'll be lots of hard conversations had in public, but that's not bad. I don't, I, I, I don't think that's bad. Uh, I think that's healthy. Um, I'd rather know what's going on than not know what's going on. I appreciate your honesty there and candor because it's so lacking in politics today when people are actually quote, like honest about what they believe and what they're going to do. Um, I want to talk about one of the major issues around the world right now, and that is the ongoing escalation in uh, Ukraine. While it is not a quote unquote Alberta issue, we do have a large Ukrainian population here in the province, and they are struggling right now. Um, they are hurting seeing all the issues that are going on in Ukraine. We are seeing this the, the federal government stand up and say we are banning all crude oil or oil refined products from Russia. And that is having the conversation, bringing the conversation close to home here in Alberta. With Energy East, and Northern Gateway Pipeline, the two major pipelines that are potentially going to be built, if they do, which one would you be advocating for as Premier of this province to go forward faster to get Alberta's oil to market as an ethically eco-friendly product? Well, again, um, I, Chris, I, I don't quite operate in the sense that, you know, I pick one and then advocate. I think in my in this case, uh, I would be, again, you, you got to go out there and say, okay, first of all, to the, to the stakeholders involved, and let's face facts, uh, to the refineries down in eastern, eastern Canada or the expert, export play to across the Pacific, you know, how do we, how do we enable this to happen? To make arbitrary statements, I think, is, is what we've, where we got ourselves in a bit of trouble here before. You know, in the tradition of, you know, the reason Alberta was successful uh, with Peter Lougheed and that kind of that change in governance, the way we, we, we managed everything was we, we had respect across the Federation. Peter Lougheed carried, carried sway in those rooms discussing national issues from Alberta's perspective, but, but also understanding what was going on across the country and 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 you're right that you know the ukraine situation which is terrible and my heart goes out to that to those countries that are being victimized by by a by a bully uh whose mental state can be certainly questioned as as, as to what their views are but you know um you you have to you have to work this together I mean, every situation where we go down a bad path is usually precipitated by bad planning, uh, by poor planning, not being prepared, not being ready. And uh, you, you can't do that in a country this vast. You can't do that from a long, la uh, landlocked province without cooperating, without working, building respect and confidence in, in what you're trying to do. And um, I don't know which one would be best, you know, probably to some degree, uh, they both have uh, an equal amount of, in, in terms of, um, of importance to the world stage, in, in terms of potentially, you know, kind of disarming those kinds of rogue states that want to use, uh, use the oil wealth to, to precipitate war and, and disruption and those kinds of things. So there's probably a really pan-Canadian view of it. And that's how we should be doing it. But Alberta should lead by being respectful and understanding and advancing that case in that regard and not saying we must do this now 
you got to get out of the way. That's the wrong attitude. The attitude is Alberta is here to help provide that opportunity for Canada and to help stabilize the world as a result. Let's work together to do that as a country. I think something would happen, whatever that solution is. But again, I, I wouldn't arbitrarily say I must have this or we must do that. You have to be, uh, you have to be thoughtful in that. No, I, 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 I wanted to ask this to a political leader and while well, you're on the show, so I'm gonna ask you. We, we have the fourth largest uh, reserves of oil of bitumen in the world. Fifth, if I'm not mistaken, fourth or fifth, one of the top. But we, we export it to get refined. Why aren't we doing that here? Why are we not refining the product here in the province? I know we do have oil refineries across the province, but shouldn't we be doing more to refine it here and then shipping it out that way? Like, it just seems to me very redundant that we're shipping it out and then buying it back to sell to our own consumers. Shouldn't we be doing it more here? Yeah, it, you know, on the surface, it makes sense, Chris, and I don't know what stands in the way. I, I've talked to some people about that. Regulation gets in the way here. Um, sometimes, you know, and, and in particular, I don't know how the economics work relative. And, you know, we haven't really had to incentivize value added because we've, we've kind of done well without it. So I don't think, again, we've planned very well. And it's not just in oil and gas that we've done this, you know. Our agricultural products go out raw. Our forestry products go out raw and unfinished and unprocessed. And we're not just now starting to understand that there's opportunity there, there's value add there. And, you know, we're just behind, plain and simple. We haven't paid attention to it enough in the past. And maybe that's just simply it. Uh, my understanding is that refineries and, and, and those type of processing, whether it's for agriculture, I know for agriculture for sure, happening even in other provinces and certainly other countries, but on the oil and gas side, certainly happening in other places. So that means that the opportunity should stand for Alberta. I just don't think we've paid enough attention to it, to be honest. Uh, we haven't planned for, uh, for a better opportunity. And uh, again, we can't rest on that instant wealth kind of luck of the draw mentality going forward. Those resources are finite and we should be looking at those things to take maximum advantage. We pride ourselves on going beyond that 15 second soundbite by becoming a backer of the show. With a quick visit to patreon.com and searching cross-border interviews, you can help continue this show. For as little as $3 a month, your support can ensure we grow and bring new and exciting things to our growing listenership. Click the link in the show notes and back the show today. I want to touch on a subject that is uh, breaking a lot of people's hearts here in northern, well, in northern Alberta right now, and that is the discovery of potentially 169 unmarked graves of former, well, not former, but of Indigenous children in Gurard, Alberta, which is, if those who are listening don't know, that is uh, just literally between High Prairie and Slave Lake, Alberta take the middle, go up north, and you're there. Um, I, I, I don't want to say this was not, uh, this was a shock, because it shouldn't be, because we knew stories like this are happening across Canada, and it was just time until this happened here in Alberta, and this is not the first time, it's been a few times now. Um, I want to get your thoughts on what was discovered this week, and how, as a province, we need to heal the divisions that we have in our province because of the treatments that we did to our First Nations communities? So, uh, so first of all, I've, I've reached out to Chief uh, Harlan, uh, Sydney Harlan in, in, in the area, and um, we're going to hopefully have a conversation in the future about some of the things that need to be done. But, but first of all, uh, you know, um, I guess you know, after the 215 in, in Kamloops happened and there was kind of a kind of a mass realization that all of the stories that were laying around the periphery of our conversations were true and that there was a, at minimum a huge disrespect and, and now we see that actually, you know, there was 
purpose and forethought and, and actually malice and intent with some of this stuff. Um, you know, it's going to be a tough conversation, and, but we need to have it. It's going to be painful and it's, it's going to be uh, shocking, but we need to continue on that path. We, you know, this, this shouldn't be a news cycle item. This should be a, an opportunity for a few more people across this province to stop and understand what it is at the core we have to do. And we can't do that on our own. I, as a non-Indigenous person, can't do that on my own. We have to reach into that community. We have to be respectful of what they're going through and we have to support, support that community. And I mean, I, I, you know, and I, I, I applaud the government uh, for giving some money to help um, facilitate that, that discovery as, as gruesome and as, as difficult as that's going to be, but it shouldn't stop there. There is a lot of things that need to be done to action reconciliation, to, to talk about the things uh, that we need to do to actually shift the way we deal with Indigenous and Métis in this province and move into their perspective and to stop talking for a minute and just listen and understand. And there's got to be, for those that are, are um, under-resourced and, and need help, I think we need to step in there. And for the rest of Albertans, I think, you know, some of us will be confused. Some of us will not understand. Some of us will be unaware. It's time to raise that level on all those things. Um, again, this is going to take a long time. It's going to be difficult and hard. But I think what it comes down to, Chris, is we have to support uh, our, our, in, our Indigenous residents in this province. Uh, we have to do what we can to get behind them and help them through what's going to be you know, we had a lot of residential schools. I can't remember what the total number in Alberta. I know it's significant. This is going to be a long, long road, but we have to be prepared to stand with them for sure. I, I appreciate your statement that you don't want it to be a, a day news cycle because we, we, we have seen that in the past with atrocities like this, especially uh, when it comes out on a daily basis or on a weekly basis that more undiscovered, uh, more uh, unmarked graves are being found, uh, it desensitizes you sometimes. And we can't become desensitized to issues like this. And I, I, I know this is your interview and I want to make sure that you get time to talk, but I just want to make sure that people know that every time that these things, the, the like stories like this come out, we need to stop and take a moment and actually remember that these are people's loved ones and kids and yep. they had stories to tell so i just want to make sure i say that on the record as well so i apologize for you know chris you're you're absolutely right uh you know we've uh we've, we've got to treat start to treat it like that that this is the community issue and a, a provincial issue and we have to treat it like residents of the community neighbors and friends uh provincial residents and we have to start dealing with it like that this isn't something tucked away in a book or back in history uh, that, you know, that, you know, well, I read about it, it's okay. No, that's not how we have to deal with this. Uh, we, we have to be the support that we would be for anybody else in any other tragic situation. And uh, the sooner we get there, the better off we'll all be. I appreciate that. Uh, the last subject I want to touch on here before we let you go, Barry, and that is... Uh, 11 days from now, the people of Fort McMurray, Lac La Biche are heading to the polls. Uh, March 15th, they're heading to the polls to elect their next MLA for the riding. Uh, the Alberta party has field a candidate. I'm going to pronounce her last name wrong here. I do apologize if she's listening, but Michelle Lansow? Lansedal. Lansedal, okay. Lansedal. Uh, but uh this is a big get for the alberta party she is well known in the area and she is well liked she ran in the last municipal election she has oil and gas industry background um just talk talk to me talk me through why michelle would be the next uh, a great mla for the people of fort mcmurray lac la biche well, uh, she will be a great uh, mla for the she understands the community she's exactly what politics what representation needs she's She's smart, she's connected, she understands uh, the lifeblood of that community. Um, uh, and uh, she's, she'll bring the perspective to the legislature that rep truly represents Lac La Biche and Fort McMurray. Um, 
you know, one of the things the Alberta Party is really, really proud of, and I'm really proud of, is you know, when you say we've asked a couple of questions around how do we trust you, kind of how will you do that? We've always done it. I've always had to manage a diverse group of people as mayor, as a councillor, uh, with a mayor. I, we've had to do that, and and the perspectives across this province are different. So we need very strong MLAs to bring that perspective into that conversation and make sure that their views are represented well and that their solutions actually advantage them. And I, I've, I've said this everywhere I go, I do not believe that one solution fits every single area in this province. And if we don't have good, strong representation, that's, that's not gonna be reflected in the policies we do. So, so Fort, uh, Fort McMurray has some really unique issues. The whole EMS dispatch issue, you know, doesn't work there. It plain and simple doesn't work. I, I was, I've been there twice and every time I go there, I hear stories, it doesn't work. Yet we have a province that says, oh no, the system's working fine. Not there, it's not. And so why aren't we addressing it? And if we have to address it differently than it is in Brooks, I don't care. I just want the people of Fort McMurray to have the same opportunities. Michelle understands that. And uh, I think, uh, you know, by-elections are weird. <laughs> so who knows what will happen? I know that a, a vote, vote for Michelle is not going to be a wasted vote. But she would be just a great MLA. Um, now, uh, for those who have been following our Twitter feed, you know that we, uh, the show is going on the road here, potentially this weekend, maybe early next week when uh, advanced voting starts on the 8th. But we're going to head up to Fort McMurray, Lac La Vish, to see what's happening on the ground. Um, I want to know, because you said you've been there twice before. Are you planning on making a stop and helping out Michelle during the uh, last few days of the campaign? Can we see uh, the leader tour going up there? Absolutely. In fact, I'm... Uh just working out logistics to help out with some, some sign pickups for her going up to Lac La Biche and uh, planning to be there this weekend and planning to be there in the, the last weekend of the campaign as well. So um, whatever support Michelle needs, I'm there. This is, our, this is our, one of the Alberta party priorities to, to support our candidate. Um, and uh, it's a great opportunity for, for us to uh, showcase how the Alberta party would govern Alberta differently. Uh, my last question for you before we do uh, our goodbyes here, Barry, and that is, we are, uh, I, our, our friend over at the former Dave Berta podcast said, we are now officially in the red zone of the election season. Uh, one year from today, Alberta can officially go to the polls if uh, Jason Kenney decides to pull uh, the election, but he has until May to call it. How is candidate recruitment going? Have you started looking at candidates for all 87 ridings or are you planning on running candidates in all 87 ridings? I'll start off with that question before I go into the next question. So, yeah, so functionally, uh, all of this is going to come to a head at our, in our March board. Um, the president of the party has uh, got rules set out. We're going to allow those to move on. So we'll be able to start um, having CAs have their leader or have their um contests for nominations uh, as quickly as they're prepared. Our goal, we think, I, I don't think for uh, that there, we're gonna have trouble getting 87 candidates. There's been an incredible amount of interest. So, um, you know, looking at the timeline going forward, you'll see a lot of activity happening between uh, late spring and, and early fall. We're gonna have an AGM in early fall and a policy convention, which will set the stage for the election. So it's gonna be a very busy summer for the Alberta party. and. I think you're going to see a lot of candidates nominated in that period of time. Awesome. Well, I want to thank you, Barry, for doing this. This has been an honor and a pleasure. We have covered a lot of subjects in the last uh, 45 minutes, 50 minutes, and I appreciate you taking time out of your day and uh, sitting down and chatting about these issues because I think it is important to get different perspectives across uh, Alberta, but it's also important to hear from our party leaders. So thank you so much for doing this. No, and thank you, Chris, the opportunity. Uh, I, I love the questions you ask. And, and I think these are timely things. They matter to Albertans. So um, I really appreciate the opportunity to, to speak to your listeners. It's great. So with that, uh, my name is Christopher Brown, the host of the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. Have yourself an excellent day. And remember, guys and girls and everyone, get out from behind Twitter and have a conversation with someone because it does make democracy better and it makes our society a much better place as well. So with that, have yourself an excellent day. And we'll... Thank you.